Welcome one and all Super Mondays here in the Holy Land, the Holy Apple, the Holy Hilltop of Tal Binyamin. We are on the ninth day of Tevet, 5782, uh, a day before the, uh, hopefully the fast will not happen. Uh, we won't need to fast and uh, we will already have built, rebuilt the temple uh, today. Okay, uh, today's class, it's really part two, but I'm going to uh, give the class a different name because a few things have happened since the last class. So today's class is titled, Where is our outrage? Where is our outrage? Folks, I can't tell you when, uh, when I was listening to this rabbi, former soldier in the elite unit of the, the cherry unit, in Hebrew it's called Duvdivan, when I was, I gave the 16 quotes of his class, uh, you know, I was sure that it was going to really rile up and upset and people but how disappointing it is that uh, only a hundred plus people heard the class, listened to the class. And the message, unfortunately, if a hundred people, a hundred plus people listen, that's not getting the message out. If all those hundred people would send it to five people, so we already have, uh, you know, there's, it's already a different situation, just five people. So, um, between the last class and this class, I've, I've written so far four letters, four emails that I've sent to Torah Anytime, probably the biggest uh, website of classes in the entire world. There are, they do tremendously good, great things. There is no doubt. There is no dispute on that. However, this class must be either A, removed, this class by this, uh, uh, this Israeli rabbi, former uh, soldier, it must be either removed or they must allow a, they must uh, uh, allow a refuting class, which would be uh, God willing, we're going, to, we're going to have three to four classes on as a uh, refutal to what the rabbi said. So it's a time really for outrage because people, what they listen to on Torah any time, they believe if they're newcomers to Judaism, they believe that this is a representative representation of Judaism and this is forbidden. A Jew is called a Jew because we're named after Yehuda and Yehuda comes from the word Hoda'a to thank, to give thanks, to be appreciative so, there are many things that are wrong with the army in the land of Israel. That is for sure, and that there is no dispute on that. But just like there is no dispute that there are problems, if there is no dispute that they save, they save hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people. There are seven million people in the land of Israel. Seven million. So, the essence of a Jew, we are called Jews because we're, we take the name of Judah. Judah was named that name of thanksgiving from his mother Leah, who thanked Hashem after her fourth child, Reuven Shimon Levin Yehuda. And 
the connection that I see to this class being the class after Hanukkah is that if you do the numerical value of the name Leah, it comes up to 36. Leah is connected big time to Hanukkah. There are 36 candles. If we do not count the, uh, the uh, tall shamash candle, there are 36 candles. Leah represents the holiday of Hanukkah. So therefore, we must, at, at the foundation of Judaism, the reason we are called Jews is because we appreciate, we remember kindness, we reciprocate in kindness. So therefore this is awful. Not to have appreciation for Jews that day and night in the heat, in the cold, put themselves on the line for all of us. This is absolutely disgusting. So folks, if these boys, and it does, it's not just boys, you continue after reserve duty, person continues on for dozens of years, if they could take off years of their lives in order to protect Jews, can we take five minutes and get off our blank and get onto the computer, go on to Torah anytime. You'll see on the bottom right, it says write us, W-R-I-T-E, write us. Put down there that you are demanding, you are average, you are furious that, an, that a rabbi from Israel, a former soldier for five years in the elite cherry unit that's enough i'm not gonna have, i'm not gonna say his name but that's enough information and you're asking the the disgusting things that he had to say about the army and about uh jews that defend the land of israel and the people of israel and the torah of israel we are demanding you are demanding that the class be removed or you are demanding that a refutal shall be allowed and I will contact them and I have the classes already, they're up on YouTube and they'll be up on Torah anytime. But there must be a response here. You know folks that in the wars of Israel uh, up until Memorial Day, this past Memorial Day in the uh, summer, 23,982 23, 23, Jews have been killed in wars to defend the land of Israel and the people of Israel. 23,982. Everyone has family, parents, brothers, sisters, wives, husbands, relatives, friends, family. I looked up statistics, how many Jews have been injured by the Arab Amalekim, by these Muslim Amalekim. I was not able to find statistics, but you could guess we're talking about, uh, we're talking about tens and tens of thousands of Jews who have been injured and are suffering, many of them are suffering till this very day. We owe them to get off our seats, get on our computers, write that letter. There's no place on a religious Torah website for those accusations, for those disgusting words against Jews. I don't care if they have kippahs or don't have kippahs, beards or no beards. Please do it now. Okay, moving right along. With that said, last week we began after quoting the 16 quotes of the rabbi, uh, former soldier of Israel. After we quoted him, we spoke about the commandment. The commandment, do not stand idly by 
your brother's blood. And we delved into that side of the equation here. Now, okay, we're going to move right along. Part two. Besides, for the commandment not to stand idly by your brother's blood, that when you see the Jewish people are in danger, you go out to protect them. Besides for that, there is also a commandment. It's called Milchemet Mitzvah, an obligatory war. It's a commandment like any other commandment, like sitting in a sukkah, putting on tefillin, putting up a mezuzah on your doorpost. It's a commandment like learning Torah. Obligatory war. Maimonides, in the Laws of Kings, chapter 5, law 1. An example of an obligatory war is helping Israel from those that come up to afflict her. Once again, helping Israel from those that come up, armies, nations, individuals, whatever it might be, to come up to afflict, to cause us damage, to harm us. It is an obligatory war. It is a commandment to go out and fight. This is not just brought down in Maimonides. This is brought down in the book Sefer Achinuch. It's brought down in Commandment 425. It's also brought down on the tractate of Sota in the beginning of chapter 8 by the commentator the Me'iri. Including in this commandment, this obligatory war that every Jew is obligated to fight, enemies that are planning, Maimonides mentioned that the, uh, the enemy is coming up to, to afflict us, cause us damage, to terrorize us, whatever it might be. But not only if they're coming up and we see them coming around the mountain when they come, but also if we know that an enemy is planning an attack in the future, then we have in the Code of Jewish Law, the Laws of Sabbath, three, uh, chapter 329, Law 6, we have the Ramah that writes that if we know that a, a country, a nation, a group might come in the future and attack us, we must go out first and attack them. Even if it's on the Sabbath, we are obligated to go out and first, those that come to kill you, get up and kill them first. So even if we do not see them in the distance, but we know that they are planning, we're not sure exactly when, but we know that they are, they are planning. So as soon as we know this, we are allowed to preempt attack the enemies. This is included in the obligatory war. Another type of obligatory war is when Gentiles come to take the land of Israel from the Jewish people. This too is obligatory. Where do we see this? We see this in Maimonides chapter 5 verse 1. We see this also in Maimonides, fasting, the laws of fasting, chapter 2, uh, law 1, and chapter uh, 2, law 3. So laws 1 and 3 in chapters 2. Also, this is written in black and white in the book, the Code of Jewish Law called Arucha Shulchan, the future uh, Code of Jewish Law. This could be found in the Laws of Kings, chapter 74, paragraph four. So we see very clearly that in a numerous scenarios that are possible and we see them all in the land of Israel. We see enemies 
nations that have come up, up to terrorize us, that have come up to destroy us, to murder us, to annihilate us, to take the land of Israel from us. We have it all in one little package. You could include every single detail that we just gave uh, into the package called the obligatory war that we face today in the land of Israel. This is not hell, as the rabbi called it, his army service, protecting the Jewish people, protecting the Jewish nation. This is not hell, this is an obligatory war. We look at it as any commandment. We don't look at commandments as hell. When Abraham took up his only son, which he had waited for a hundred years, Isaac, he didn't look at it as, oh my, this is hell on earth. Why is Hashem putting me through hell? No, he got up early in the morning. He went with joy to fulfill a commandment, not hell, heaven. Next. What is the status? What is the Jewish outlook on people, individuals, groups that go out and defend Jews, try to protect other Jews? What, how does Judaism, the Torah, look at such people? even though, let's say, they might not be religious. Unfortunately, many of the soldiers in the army are not religious. Many are, but many are not. True, unfortunately. So, put on that seat belt, because we're, re we're really going to lace up these gloves, and we're going to hit hard here. After the disgusting words, of that rabbi. Number one, the legendary spiritual director of the Mir Yeshiva, the biggest Yeshiva in the world, over 5,500 students here in the land of Israel. Rabbi Chaim Shmulevitz, during the holiday of Sukkot in 1973, that should ring a bell, it was the Yom Kippur War. Listen to the words of the rabbi. How do we look at Jewish soldiers? What is the proper Torah outlook? Listen closely. There was a, there's a story in the Talmud, Tractate Bhava Batra. And there we are told that that Yosef, the son of Rabbi Yoshua, had a clinical death experience. After some time, Joseph came back to life. His father asked him, Joseph, what did you see when you left this world temporarily? Joseph's answer was, I saw an upside down world. Those that were considered on the top of the world, this world, were really now at the bottom. And those that were passed over, those that were not looked upon as being anything special, 
they were on the top of the world. I'm on the top of the world looking down on creation. No extra charge. His father, Joseph's father, Rabbi Yoshua, replied, My dear Joseph, you did not see an upside down world. You saw the true world. People in this world who are downtrodden, stepped upon, belittled, made fun of, they are on the top. And those that had money, and those that were haughty and were at the top of the world, they are really low lives on the bottom of the pedestal. You saw the true world, how it really is in heaven. And Rabbi Yoshua asked his son, Joseph, what else did you see? And he said, you know what? I saw that there was a case in the city of Lod, next to Tel Aviv. The king's daughter had been found killed. And of course, who was blamed for the daughter's death? The Jewish people. The king said, if you do not find me, the perpetrators of my daughter's murder, I will kill all the Jewish people in the city of Lod. If you remember some months ago, when we had the gigantic Arab uprising all over Israel, uh, one of the big centers of terrorism against the Jewish people was once again the city of Lod. Some things, baby, don't change. So once again, this is the Talmud, Bava Batra, page 10, side B. So there were two Jews that stood up. One was name is Papus and one was Luli, Lulinus. Not easy names there. And they went up to the king and they said, you know what? We are the two that murdered your daughter. And they were killed. They took the bullet for the entire Jewish people. In order to save and protect the Jewish people, they took the bullet for the entire Jewish people. So, this Joseph who had a clinical death experience, he said, I saw when I was in the, in the above worlds, I saw that not even angels, not even angels are allowed to come anywhere close to these two Jews who sacrificed their lives so other Jews can live. Not even angels can come close to them. They are so holy. They are so respected. No one can come close to them. Folks, do we hear this Talmud? Do we hear this Gomorrah in our ears? People that went out to protect the Jewish people and took the bullet for the Jewish people. Not even an angel can come close to them. They are so high. They are so godly. So holy. So, back to Rabbi Chaim Shmulevitz. He's giving this talk in Jerusalem at the yeshiva, the Mir yeshiva. That's what I, that's he, the, what he was thinking about when he was thinking about the Jewish soldiers in the IDF, Israel Def Defense Forces. That's the Gomorrah that he was thinking about. People that are willing to take the blow and sacrifice for the entire Jewish nation. That's what he was thinking about soldiers. And he goes on. Listen to what he says. I'm translating here. This is what I have to say about the soldiers that are sacrificing themsel themselves for our, to save us. 
that no one in this world can stand in their four cubic meters. No one can come close to them. They are above us. And we have an obligation to pray for them without any limitations. You're tired? Rabbi Chaim Shmulevitz says, keep on going. There is no limitations. Keep on praying. Keep on learning for them. If they're going without sleep, you go without sleep. Not to throw in a psalm for two minutes and I've done, whoa, I'm really beat. I'm really tired. No, there is no limitation. That's what Rav Chaim Shmulevitz says. And then he brings in an amazing proof to what he's saying. When Moses fled Egypt, he was taken into the home of Yitro, Jethro. Now, we have to understand that by Moses, he was let in. He was invited to stay in the house of Jethro. Don't forget, Moses did a tremendous amount of, uh, of, uh, of good for the Jethro's family. He saved the seven daughters from the shepherds. And also, he was the head shepherd of the flocks of Jethro so that the girls wouldn't have to take the sheep out, which is a dangerous occupation for women at that time. So he had reciprocated very much so to the kindness that was given to him when he fled Egypt. Even so, the, the, our sages tell us in Shemot Rabbah, chapter 4, Paragraph 2, that when God came to Moses in Mijan and told Moses, it's time to leave and it's time to save the Jewish people, Moshe Rabbeinu calls a time out on the court and he says, God, not yet, not so fast. Why not? It's time to save the Jewish people. Think about that, folks. We have an entire Jewish people to save here. And Moshe is saying, not too fast. Every second can count. Every second that Moses delays, it could be somebody being injured, somebody being whipped, punished, killed, murdered. Every second counts. Doesn't matter. Moses is teaching us a tremendous eternal lesson. What is that lesson? The lesson is that if somebody opened up their door, if somebody was kind to you and let you in their home, you are, we are obligated to even give over our souls to that person. Amazing thing. In Hebrew, nafsho chayavlo. A person has to, uh, a person has to uh, understand that he was redeemed. He was kept alive by this person who brought them in. If a person does a kindness to us, we owe them the world. That's the best way to put it. We owe them the world. So Moses says, I have to go first to my father-in-law Jethro and ask permission. And then I will leave I will leave Midian. It doesn't tell us how long that took, but it's a process. It's not just one second. And even so, even though there could have been a danger to the Jews in Egypt, Moses wanted to teach us this eternal lesson of gratitude. So, so Rabbi Chaim Shmulevitz brings down this, how much more so? If Moses, who gave so much over to Jethro and his family, he saved their daughters, and he took upon himself to shepherd the sheep. He returned so much, he had so much gratitude. Even so, Moses felt he had, he, he, he was in debt forever to Jethro that opened up his doors. 
and therefore I will have to receive permission from him first. If that is so, how much more so than these soldiers that not only okay, uh, much greater are putting their whole lives on the line for the Jewish people, how much more so that we have an unlimited amount of gratitude, prayer, fasting, learning for their sake, for their benefit, after what, all that they've done for us. Those are the Torah words. That is the true Jewish outlook. And we go further. Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, former chief Sephardic rabbi of Israel, in 1983. This is brought down in a book called the Sar HaTorah, the head, uh, the head of the Torah, yeah, on page 240. So there Rabbi Ovadia Yosef says the following. that these soldiers are helping all of the Jewish people. They are doing kindness with all of us here in Israel. These soldiers, God should protect them coming and going and they should have a long life and they should have peace upon them. For, forever and they shall return to their homes in peace and hold those are that is the Torah the Torah outlook ideology how to look at soldiers that go out and day night summer winter fall spring whenever it is and for years, days and nights, and for years go out. That is the proper. They are serving the Jewish people. They are doing kindness to all of us. Serving the Jewish people. The Tractate Sanhedrin, page 103, side B. We are told there that, that the kings, Ahaz and Ahaziah, and all similar kings to these two, that state, there's a verse that mentioning, when they're mentioning these kings' names, it's written, they committed evil in the eyes of God. So, the Talmud is telling us, specifically naming two kings, Ahaz and Ahaziah, but not only these two kings, any other king that the verse, uh, when mentioning them, says that they did the evil in the eyes of God, those specific words, know that these kings have a special status. On one hand, they're not in hell. On the other hand, they're not in heaven either. They have like a special, special place for them. They're neither here or there. Why is that? So the commentator, the Yad Rama, his name was Rabbi Meir Abu Lafia. He lived in Spain in the 1200s, 1240 to be exact. So we're talking here about a Rishon, one of the early sages. And he writes on his commentary to the Talmud, Tractate Sanhedrin 103b, listen closely. God's lenience towards these kings comes due to the fact that they made efforts to fight to protect the Jewish people in wars and felt the pain of the Jewish people. I'm going to say it again 
Open up your ears, clean them out if you need, a, need to. Listen to these words. We're talking about kings that did the evil in the eyes uh, of God, okay? We're not talking about righteous people. And even so, they have this special status that they're not, uh, they're not in hell, even though they were evil. And evil people go to hell, but they're not there. They're not in paradise either. They're in a special, you know, special zone, diplomatic zone, we might call it. Why? God was lenient to them. These are the words of the commentator, the Yad Rama, Rabbi Meir Abu Lafia. God was lenient to them since they went out to fight to protect the Jewish people in wars and felt the pain of the Jewish people. That is enough to give you this special diplomatic zone status. Even though you are wicked and you did evil things, it saved them from hell. Moving right along, listen to this. Close those windows so you don't fly out. The famous ethical book called Peleoetz, it was written in the Jewish year 5664. So we're talking about 118 years ago. In this book, Peleoetz, it was written by Rabbi Eliezer Papo. And he writes under the banner of saving saving he writes the following that the Jewish people should know that in many many governments and parliaments and palaces there are Jews that try to annul any decree against the Jewish people there are people that spend much of their days and much of their years in within the government trying to protect the Jewish people. And even though they look, these people are very simple people, and they look like they are empty vessels, the word of the Peleoets, Rabbi Papo, they look like they are empty vessels but know that they have this commandment of saving the Jewish people in their hands and folks you know that song we got the whole world in our hands we got the whole world in our hands we got the whole wide world in our hands yeah well if you got that mitzvah if you got that mitzvah, as it says in the tractate of Sanhedrin, page 37, side A, that a Jew that saves one Jew as if he saved an entire world. So, Rabbi Eliezer Papo is telling us that even though these people that have jobs and positions in various governments and parliaments and palaces in order to protect the Jewish people that someday there might be a decree against the Jewish people that's why they kept their positions for that possibility to save the Jewish people and even though even though they look to us to be people that are simple people that do not are empty vessels they do not have merit they do not have commandments you know it says about even Jews that are far away they they are full but these Jews they even they don't even look full like a pomegranate like the seeds of a pomegranate they look totally empty even so listen to this because of the fact that they have this one commandment which we said is equal to an entire world. We've got the whole wide world in our hands. 
this commandment is so important that they surpass the, the scholars and the heads of the Jewish people, the spiritual leaders of the Jewish people. Can you, I mean, put clear the, the wax out of our ears to hear what he's saying here? These simpletons, these simple people, are, have surpassed the spiritual leaders of the Jewish people because of their kindness to try to protect the Jewish people, even though they are empty vessels. Take that one, Grand Slam. As you say, Tomer, the ball is still flying out of the stadium. Moving right along. In the Jerusalem, Jerusalem Talmud, the Tractate of Tanit, Chapter 1, Jewish Law, Number 4. Listen to this amazing story. There was a Jewish man, his name was, I hope I'm pr pronouncing it correctly, Panteteka. Panteteka. He was known for his lewd behavior. You got that right. Rabbi Abahu saw in a dream that the rain that had fallen during a drought was due to the prayers of this lewd Jew, Panatetka. Rabbi Avahu was perplexed. How in the world? We have righteous people. They got big kippahs on. They got long beards. They got long side curls. How could it be that this dude, his prayers were answered, and we're fasting, we're praying, we're learning the Torah, and nothing is moving, and this dude comes along, and listen to Let's look at what business this person was in. This Pentateca. So Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Abau summoned him to his home to find out what merit this sinner had. So Pentateca explained that each day he would transgress five commandments. Well, it's like a good start. You know, wow, I could really understand why God listened to your prayers. What is the world is going on? Maybe for his honesty. No, but he says, every day I transgress five commandments relating to prostitutes. But once, a woman came to my theater and she was crying. When I asked her why she was crying, she explained that in order to release her husband from prison, she has to come to this theater to make money off of prostitution. May Hashem have mercy. This is amazing. What in the world is going down here? Like this is like Ripley's Believe It or Not. We really, it's hard for us to believe here. So we have this Pantetka, and he's in the... Uh, uh, I guess the pimp business and he works prostitutions and once he has a little bit of a merit once a woman crying her husband was captured and in order to release her husband she had to do prostitution when Pentetka heard this he said no ma'am you don't have to I'm going, I have some furniture, extra furniture, I will sell it, and the money that I receive for my furniture, for my garage sale, is going to go to you, and you redeem your husband, please. Folks, 
various commentators are baffled, of course, with this. I mean, it's very nice. It's very nice that he felt bad for this Jewish woman. But I mean, this guy is, he admits every single day he's, he's transgressing five commandments and prostitution, pimp. I don't know if we can get any lower. But many of the commentators say that even that job was not a, he did not take that job because he was an evil person. He took that job in order to save Jewish women from prostitution. Because if he wasn't there choosing the prostitutes, then other persons, other people would choose Jewish women or coerce Jewish women to take part in prostitution. So he was, he was lowering himself. He was getting himself all dirty in the mud with all of this, all these women, these unmodest, with the immodest women and all of this stuff taking around, it has a toll on you. It's just making him all dirty. But he's doing it to save Jewish women. For his merit, rain came down. Not to the righteous, not to the scholars, to this man trying to save Jewish women from prostitution. Taking a spiritual hit for all our benefit, like our soldiers. <clears throat> Moving right along, Maimonides, in a document in a work called Sanctification of God's Name. If you have the Rabbi Shilat edition, it's on page 51. Listen to the words of Maimonides. He's talking about the laws of sanctification of God's name. I translate. If God will give merit to a person to reach the highest pedestal of life, very interesting, what is the highest pedestal that one can reach? On the Richter scale, where's the highest pedestal? Even if a person has sins and transgressions, like the King Giravam, the son of Navat, and his friends. They did a lot of terrible things. They worshipped idols. But even so, if a person is willing to give himself, give himself for the Jewish people to sanctify God's name. He has a share or she has a share in the world to come. And this is what the Talmud says, that in a place where those two men, Papus and Lulinus, when they sacrificed themselves, gave their own lives in order to protect the Jewish people in the city of Lod, so too no one can come close to these righteous people. Even though when you look at them and you look at their command, how many commandments they have done, how many mitzvot they have done, how many transgressions and sins they have done, the sins far outweigh the commandments that they do, even though they're not religious, or like these, like uh, Yeravam ben Avat, he was not only not religious, but he incited the Jewish people against Torah, against the commandments. Even so, even though people are on a low spiritual level, but they are protecting, they are giving themselves up for the Jewish people. 
No one can come close to the righteousness of these people. And we finish this segment of the class, part two, with a final story. In the times of the Marsha, the Marsha was Rabbi Shmuel Eliezer Idolitz. He lived 400 years ago. And in the times of the Marsha, there was a very wicked Jew in, in their city, community, village, whatever, wherever he lived. And he was the worst person possible. He would turn in. He would think on other Jews. He would go to the authorities and turn over Jews. Now, in Judaism, you can't get lower than that. That is the lowest of lows. You could kill a person like that. Doesn't matter if he's Jewish or not. You can kill a person that's about to turn over. Uh, not only physically turn over a Jew, but even financially to, to take Jewish money and turn it over. You could kill that person. This was the extra prayer. There were Originally there were only 18 prayers in the Amida, the the uh, three-time daily prayer that we have, but we added one because during, during this period of history there were many Jews that were turning on their brothers and sisters and turning them over to the authorities. So there was a special blessing against these types of people to curse them out and Hashem should destroy these kinds of people. These are the lowest of the lows. So, eventually, thank God, this guy passed away. And as you can imagine, when they were looking for a minyan, a quorum, to bury this dude, nobody wanted to come. Not surprising. This guy spent his life trying to, uh, on, on the back of other Jews, to benefit from his, uh, from his turning over Jews and information on Jews to the government and to the officials uh, tried to benefit off the Jewish people's backs. They were having difficulty finding ten people to bury this low life. Eventually they were able to probably pay them off or something. They were able to find ten Jews. And in the middle of the procession, the funeral procession, one of the Marsha's students in his Talmudic Academy comes by. Once again, we have a, this person is dead. This Jew is dead. And he just slaps him across the face. And everyone's laughing. So we have this student of the Marsha comes by. There's a dead, there's a dead evil Jew here. And he just slaps him across the face. Everybody's laughing. And that day he was buried. That night, this dead Jew, this evil Jew, comes in a dream to this student who slapped him up. And he says, I'm demanding that you come before me to have a Jewish tribunal court to decide your fate. I'm demanding a court appearance with you here in the heavenly world. So the student wakes up and thinks it's ridiculous because this guy was you know, this guy was, was a piece of dirt. Dirt was much, was, was greater than he was. So, he didn't really think too much of it. However, this dream reappeared three different times. <laughs> so after three different times, three straight nights, he runs, he runs to the Marsha. 
and the Marsha cannot believe what's going on. So that night, the Marsha went to sleep, and he sees this evil Jew in his dream. And he says, how do you have the audacity to demand a court appearance with one of my students? You were the evil, you were the most evil Jew on this earth. How do you have the audacity to demand a trial? He says, let me tell you something. Okay, this is an interesting night for the Marsha. So I want to tell you something. I did all those sins that you mentioned, yes. It is true. However, one time when I was walking, I noticed that a scholar, a Jewish scholar, was drowning. Even though I was not a good swimmer, even though I was endangering my own life, I jumped in to save him. And thank God I was successful. I saved this Jewish scholar. But not only did I save him one time, I continued for the rest of my life to support this Torah scholar. And therefore, with this merit of saving one Jew and not any average Jew, a Torah scholar, with this merit, this one merit, I come before God's holy court and demand, demand a trial with your student. Anyways, the Marsha tells him, listen, I'm glad to hear that detail, but you did a lot of terrible things in your life. This thing you did was really great. So, I don't think you have enough, I don't think you have enough merit to demand a hearing with my student. Once again, it's, it's a great thing that you've done. It's, it's great, and it carries a lot of weight, but not enough weight. You did so many terrible things during your life, turning over Jews to the authorities. So, we're just going to keep it 50-50. The Chatam Sofer would tell over this story of the Marsha a couple times every year. And he would end, his line would be that we never know what merit a person might have. Therefore, be very careful and scrupulous when it comes to honoring a fellow Jew. You never know, like this wicked Jew, all of his life, turning over Jews to the authorities. But in the end, this guy had a lot of merit in his pocket because one time he saved. If you save Jews, I wouldn't want to speak against those that went out to save the Jewish people, took a beating, were injured, maimed for life, were traumatized for life, were murdered for our sake, for our benefit, for our safety. I would keep my mouth shut when it came to these soldiers fighting for the Jewish people. Don't go anywhere till our next class, God willing.